whatever reason that's holding you back. There's absolutely no reason that you can't do what you want to do. And if you want to do it bad enough, you will make it happen. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the What You Don't Hear podcast. This is a life podcast. It's a story podcast where I take a deep dive into getting to know my guest all in the effort to share the side of their life story that nobody has gotten to hear before. Who am I? Well, I am your host. My name is Ross Tyson. I am a Columbus, Ohio-based, well, a lot of things. Um, I'm a self-employed creative. I'm a director. I I suppose it's often sensible to put those titles together and be cool and say creative director. But most importantly for this side of things, I am a podcaster and an avid lover of storytelling. And boy, oh boy, do we have that here for you today. So I'll try and get through this intro quickly uh, because this is a great episode this week. And It really kind of gets up there in time, um, but I promise every minute is fun and interesting. So in this episode, I sat down with my friend Stefan Brando. Stefan is a pro inline skater or a rollerblader, however you want to say that. He's also a freelance graphic designer, a creator of streetwear and clothing brands, a brand builder in general, many things, but all in all, just a fun dude to sit and get to know better. So let's just dive in because I can't wait for you guys to get to know him just as well as I did here. So let's get into it. Here it is, my conversation with Stefan Brando. Right. When that was like, even like I stopped releasing these for a little while, just cause I was like, I'm just going to give like, I don't need to be promoting my all the way then, around. It's better. It was weird because like after some time passed, I kind of identified like a bunch of people who do these similar things didn't stop releasing stuff. And at first I was like, that's so strange. But then honestly it hit me. And I think I have a new understanding for stuff like this is that like entertaining or educational content shouldn't ever stop. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Where it's like, okay, well, like maybe, you know, I don't know if my podcast does this, but maybe the best part of someone's week is these conversations. Everybody's needing entertainment. That was kind of the big thing with like skating too, is like everybody wanted to continue doing the new shows that people were still skating because with everything going on, you kind of need something to like physically and mentally get out and like get away from all of this. And people were like, one, don't politicize it. Two, mm-hmm. don't turn it into something else. It's like skating is everybody's entertainment and their escape. Like I still need to watch videos. I still need to listen to podcasts about this. Like Exactly. And that was like that was kind of how I reframed it after a couple months of not releasing anything. Is I was like, man, like obviously I'm not saying it was wrong to be no. silent for a little bit. Like I absolutely give the you know, let things breathe that truly yeah. needed to breathe. But it did in the end give me this new perspective. I was gonna say there's where, a point where you're like, wait, it's okay to start doing this again. It probably need to start yeah, doing this it's, again. It, yeah, it's it's like you can't stop the entertainment you can't yeah. stop the you know whatever value that somebody gets from this that should still be put out into the world but yeah it was like it was an interesting like transition and it's all it's interesting to hear that that was happening in other yeah. like scenarios as well but let's actually jump in to the real thing we've been chatting for a little bit right but this is your official welcome to the show so stefan Welcome. Hello, Ross. Welcome to the podcast. It's about time. We will act like we have not been speaking uh, until these microphones turned on. Mm-hmm. But what you just said is it's about time, and that is 100% accurate, because we have talked about doing this for a while, like, probably probably since I started the show. I was going to say, I feel like it's been over a year. Yeah. Yeah. We're, like, we're getting close to it before uh, spring and everything happened. But. Yes. Yeah. It's so I'm, I'm, I'm stoked that we are finally getting to make this conversation happen. I feel because like it's better timing now anyway. This yeah, is, like this is perfect time. Well, that's the funny thing is every time I feel like we almost made this happen was this weird like level up. I mean, for both of us, I'm sure, but I know that was always your answer to me. You were like, "This would actually be good timing because this cool thing just happened." Yeah, more stuff keeps happening. So now I feel like we're all like maybe it is the right time because yeah. enough cool stuff has happened where it's like, all right, now there's tons of stuff lot. that we can talk about, and I want to dig in to as much as humanly possible. You and I like to talk a lot. So we'll see if we cram this into the classic like hour and a half time frame that this normally runs. But I am stoked to have you on. And before we jump into all like the cool stuff right now, I want to get to know you better. Because you and I have sat down many times 
and we've talked about like business and everything that's going on right now. But theme of this podcast, I want to hear the story that nobody's heard. So I want to get to know you before we know all the cool things you do now. And luckily, I know yours from listening to all of your podcasts <laughs> and interviews on other places. See? So it's like, so now it's, it's I, the I have to tell you now. Yes. It, see, you know my story now. You got to yep. toss it back. So honestly, lay the groundwork for me because all I know you as is a fellow creative who loves to have a hand in everything. You know, the, the skating, the design, and all that sort of stuff. And so before we dive into the story, maybe give a quick, like, give your elevator pitch to anybody who's listening who maybe doesn't know you. Or as a creative, I know a lot of people have these kind of, like, I don't know, misunderstandings sometimes. So even if there's somebody who's your friend who might not know everything that you do or everything that you're about, toss out the elevator pitch. Who are you? I hope everybody's ready because everybody gets confused because it's a lot. So I am a professional rollerblader. So like, you know, don't know different than skateboarding, jumping off things, sliding down things. I have sponsors and, and that's a lot of my main focus and my main passion. I do graphic design, have a clothing company, do freelance design for bands, you know, a lot of logo work, branding. Um, and then I also work for a visual merchandising company called Zen Genius. So they're here locally in Columbus. We do a lot of work for L Brands, which is Victoria's Secret Express, Bath and Body Works. Um, you know, just when they need freelance workers or different projects and stuff that we can help out with that their normal staff can't help with. Um, it's a lot of that. And obviously things have been weird this year with all of that, but that's kind of my main thing is, you know, rollerblading, design, kind of like being a creative, not necessarily jack of all trades because that's kind of like my main things right there. But mm -hmm. yeah. So let's dig into it. Where does all that come from? Where does all that start? So take me back. Let's jump in the time machine. What is growing up for Stefan like? Where where are you from? What was family like? Lay it all out. So my growing up, and this is something I've realized, my early years have set the tone for the rest of my life. Um, and it's kind of like a full circle type thing. So I grew up in a very, very small town outside of Rochester, New York, about an hour and a half south called Bath. My graduating class was about 120 people. I knew every single person in my class. I knew every single person in the two classes above me and the two classes below me. Very small town. If you didn't know somebody, you at least knew who their parents were, what sport they played, what street they lived on, even if you weren't friends with them. Everybody knew everybody's business. So growing up, that was cool. Um, my dad uh, super into motocross. So that's kind of like plays into like what I get into in the future. Um, my mom has kind of always had her hands slightly in creative things, um, but she's been more stay at home than anything. Um, when I got into uh, high school, she ended up working for the Corning Museum of Glass. Um, she just took an interest in wanting to be a glass blower. So she had done like prints and, you know, just being creative in general, she took an interest in that. So that was kind of cool to have like the, the mecca of glass blowing near our hometown and my mom got to be there and work with those people. So um, here in Columbus, we have the um, conservatory and there's a lot of glass pieces. I don't know if you've seen any of that. Mm -hmm. That's all Dale Chihuly. So he's like the Michael Jordan of glass art. He's oh, the wow, number okay. one guy. Yeah, like he's like the guy, you know? Okay. So she's got to meet him, see him. Like, it, and it's just crazy to think because it's just like, yeah, mom's going to work. And yeah. you know, same thing with my dad. Like, like going to motocross races with my dad, he would just walk into the pits, like the pro pits, and he would just know this guy, know that guy, know this person, know that person. So it was just cool like seeing how both of their personalities and what they were into and how they interacted with people, how that played a massive role in who I am now. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to grow up to be like my parents. Like my parents are so cool and they're my best friends. Like I would be nowhere without them. So it's cool to see me kind of turning into like the perfect combination of both of them. Yeah. And I'm like proud of it. Like most people are like, oh man, I got that terrible thing for my dad or mm -hmm. I got this like bad habit for my mom like no like, my parents are awesome like I'm so happy to like that I came out like both of them yeah so growing up in a small town I played a lot of soccer and basketball basketball was my focus for the longest time went to a lot of camps did a lot of AAU um, got to a point where I started to get into skateboarding having a bike rollerblading snowboarding everything so I had no focus it was just a young kid I, I like jumping off stuff. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. just a young kid. Like I'll take my bike to the bleachers, jump off the, ble the bleachers. Like would have girls come over and set a lawn tramp up and jump over them on my rollerblades, like in middle school, you know, it's just all those things. It was, I would go to the skate park and take everything. So as I started to get into high school, I started to realize that team sports weren't for me. So I was getting a little more creative. I was getting into different music than everybody. I was starting to dress differently than everybody started to get really into these things that nobody else in my town did. So 
I got to this point realizing that team sports are a team. If your team doesn't care and you care, it's not fun for anybody. Mm -hmm. LeBron understands this. (laughs) So it's like if your team doesn't care about what they're doing and it's just, you know, this is, I need something to do in the winter. You know, like I'm a football player, but I need something to do in the winter, so I guess I'll play basketball. And not having the, the, the people not having the drive and, you know, not wanting to be there, it made it not fun for me when it was like something I cared about and I was passionate about. Mm-hmm. So those being me, like being into those extreme sports and then being such individual things, it kind of pulled me away at the perfect time. So maybe I want to say like maybe 2003, 2004, um, right when I got started to get into high school is when I really got into rollerblading. So, so before we go any further, I want to get your just thoughts on being from a small town because that is always such a fascinating thing to me because I am also from a small town where not a lot happens. You know, the coolest thing in that town is like if the football team wins on yep. the Friday, right? And Absolutely. Not saying there's anything wrong with that. Nope. I'm just saying like, that's just how that's it is. That's not your thing. It's very different. Yes. And it's always... I feel like I've had this conversation with so many people that I don't understand. And and by no means am I acting like I'm Mr. Badass, like awesome person, but I don't understand how I'm so different from what my town is. And I, and I feel like you're probably a similar situation. I'm very understanding of that situation. And that's also like me getting into like the rollerblading. That was also kind of when I realized that I'm not into the same things these people are. I don't act the same. I'm not, I just, I'm not like everybody in my town and I don't like the way they act. I don't like what they're doing. And I got a lot of pushback for me doing what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So growing up being the basketball kid, you know, Stefan's in, into basketball. Like he, that's, that's his life. He loves basketball. And then me being like, no, I'm going to go rollerblade in my skate park in my backyard that my dad built. So like my dad doing motocross he was very understanding of doing something outside of the norm and he always said you know you doing what you do is just what i do without a motor between your legs he's like you're still jumping stuff you're still going fast he's like i get it it's cool so like he and i had that like kinship so he was so supportive of me rollerblading but even during that time there was only a couple kids that skateboarded there was only a couple kids that rode bmx bikes and they didn't take it seriously you know there wasn't anywhere to do it So I was traveling an hour away every weekend to go places and skate. And this is a time when the the rollerblading that I was getting into at the time was how I found out about all my favorite bands and I'm still my favorite bands now. So this is the, I'm, I'm watching, I'm getting these rollerblading videos of all my favorite pros and I'm, you know, I'm slowly have gotten into music. I'm slowly getting into like finding out about like punk bands and like pop punk bands and hardcore bands and like being that kid of like, well, I'm interested in these things. Nobody else in my town is interested in these things. Mm-hmm. How do I find out about these things? So luckily I had one friend that was a year above me and she would just burn me CDs. Just like, here's a bunch of bands I think you'd like. So thank God for her. She also cut my hair, like really cool relationship growing up. So me doing that and then getting these rollerblading videos and being like, well, wait, those guys are wearing all black and tight pants like I do. It's like, I kind of like that rollerblading. And in those videos, it's Joy Division. It's New Order. It's the Sex Pistols. It's all the bands that I'm, my favorite bands still to this day, like, like, you know, Dead Boys and The Cure and like all these things that like nobody in my town had heard of. Yeah. So from day one of me doing this, I was, I don't want to say the outcast, but I I did not feel like I fit in. Yeah. And I had a lot of conversations with my mom about like, I don't understand why these kids feel the need to act the way they do when I'm doing what I want to do. Yes, I, you know, I it's, yeah. it's you know why like I grew up with these kids. I played soccer with this kid since we were four years old. You know, I, I went over to this kid's house and and played video games since we were five. Why all of a sudden now that I'm doing something that I love to do and not playing basketball and soccer with them? Why are they acting the way they are towards me? So they were so the so it shifted into like oh my god, oh Stefan's doing that. Like that's not what we think uh, is cool. Very much so. So it did. So it I, wasn't just the I kind of feel like an outcast because I'm different. It was literally you are making me feel like an outcast. 1,000%. Yeah. Um, And this is something that I've said, like I've had a couple pivotal points in my life and some of them where it's like a a click and it's like, boom, I I realize what's going on. But high school is kind of one of those things that, like I was saying, it's a full circle moment of the way I act, the way I go about my life, my personality, everything that is involved with who I am as a person today, so much of that comes from my situation in high school and how I was treated and the things that I was into. And I always, yeah. I always said growing up, I wish that I went to one of the big city schools. 
you know, I wish I had a graduating class of 800 where it was like nobody knew who I was. And I had two friends that skated. I had a friend that was into the same music as me. You know, it's, I didn't have a bad childhood by any means. I had an amazing childhood. Like I said, my parents were so supportive. My dad, every single weekend, would drive me to Philadelphia. He would drive me to Pittsburgh just to go skate, and he would just sit and watch. Yeah, you know, like yeah. I, that's that's awesome. And I don't think I would be where I am without that. So luckily, I had really cool parents that were really supportive of like having the kid in the town that had long hair and tight pants and listened to screaming music. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean. Like, yep, uh, 100%. being in a small town, like your understanding of it too. It's like everybody knows everybody, and it's parents talk, and it's kind of like, well, what's your kid doing? Like, why is your kid being like that? It's like, why isn't he well, playing sports with everybody? And my parents yeah. were like, Stefan is the way he is. He likes what he likes, and that's cooler than your kid going out and drinking on the weekend and going to a football game. Like, right. we we would rather see him do what he's doing and make something of himself. You know, like, mm-hmm. so yeah. that was like a big big part of of my life and like going forward was. Uh, how people in my hometown reacted to me doing what I was doing, but also at that time being such a pivotal point of like finding out about rollerblading, finding out about punk music and and all these things like that has shaped my life from that moment until now. Well, like, you found out how to be an individual. That yeah. That's really what that kind of, it's kind of what you unlocked is yeah. like, it's okay. And luckily, you know, having that supporting foundation of like, it's okay to just be whoever you want to be. And, and it's it's funny because, I relate to that so much. And I don't know how like deep it got into like, oh man, they really made me feel like an outcast. I remember w- one thing that was so strange to me that like, obviously after you grow up, you like kind of like subtly still hold a grudge of like, man, why did you treat me that way? But obviously you become an adult and you're like, whatever, who cares? Yeah, everybody's cool. You guys are awesome. Whatever. But there was such a, a, like I can relate because I remember when I started getting into like the music scene, and I decided that I wanted to be in a band and, and be in bands and join bands and all that sort of stuff. It was funny because there was this little group of us, I would say like the scene group in, in a small, you know, in my small town, like scene was like four or five people if you're lucky. Yes. Yeah. You, mu- you were real weird if you, yeah. you know, whatever, you know, tight pants, long, straight hair, all that sort of stuff. And it was so weird because when I decided that I wanted to take that further and not take being seen further, but take like I want to get more into this culture and I love music so I want to be a part of it there was a time where like where I like formed a band and was a part of bands and like some of those people in that scene or in that group all of a sudden turned on me and they were like talking massive shit on me it would make fun of like literally like make fun of shit on the internet and like do all this sort of stuff and like it just became this such this like strange like how dare you think you can actually do it? Like it was like this weird, like we were together in it and we all listened to the same music and went to the same shows. But then when I try to take it a step further and be like, well, I'm going to take it seriously though. I, Hey, I, I care about uh, being in a band and making it uh, marketed in a cool way, whatever that meant in like 2009. You know, I care about like, I want to go and get like a cool recording of the song or I want to promote it on Facebook. It was like when I started taking that turn that became less about like, we're people from a small town who just like something into more, I'm pursuing this. Then all of a sudden, like the door slammed shut and they were like, you're a fucking idiot, dude. And we hate you. And it was like this weird, like these are friends of mine that are all of a sudden, like really talking down on me for pursuing this thing. I have very much dealt with the same exact situation, not so so much in high school because I was so, I don't want to say so different. That's, you know, not the, not the phrase, but Everybody was doing their own thing in high school. I dealt with what you were dealing with inside of skating because inside mm-hmm. of skating, it's not cool to be passionate about skating. It's all oh, I just skate. If I'm good, I'm good, whatever. No big deal. It's like when you're passionate about it, you're kind of seen as a kook. It's like yeah. rollerblading doesn't have money. We don't have an industry. There's nowhere to go. It's like the, the top spot is like 20 or 30 guys that get a couple hundred bucks a month, if that, if they're lucky. So it's like, if you want to do that, people are like, why do you care so much? Why are you so passionate about something? So I kind of dealt with that same exact situation that you dealt with, but more so inside my own community later yeah, on. Yeah, once you got into the culture, yeah. it wasn't and, like entering it. And going back to, you know, dealing with that situation in high school and dealing with like the, you know, the outcasts are not feeling like you are fitting in. I will say this to anybody that feels like they are different, that feels like they want to do something and they're not sure because it's outside of the norm, it's outside of what their friends do. I have the thickest skin now because of dealing with those people, being myself, and not shying away from it. I was never, oh, you guys 
don't think that's cool. Well, I probably shouldn't do it. It was, you guys don't think that's cool. I'm going to go 10 times harder at it now. Yeah. And that carried over into skating and inside the rollerblading community. And this is something that I've had like recent discussions with about with people. One of the things that I think pissed people off when I was coming up in skating and like being a younger guy is I did whatever I wanted to do because it was fun and because I loved it. I don't care what's cool. I don't care who the coolest pro is, what they're wearing, what they're listening to, what the coolest trick is right now. I'm going to do what I think is fun. And if you don't like it, I don't care. And I think that pissed people off. Yeah. And, and I will say to, like I said, I'll, I'll go back to it again. I'll say this to anybody that's in this situation. Do that because that was such a life lesson to me of dealing with that. There were so many times that I felt like in my own community of outcasts, like in the action sports community, rollerbladers are the outcasts. We get nothing. We get hated on. Like, it, like in our own community, we hate each other because of being ostracized by other sports. So it's like, well, skateboarders hate on us. We might as well just keep hating kind of thing. And I always thought that was so ridiculous because it was the getaway for the outcast. And then to be outcasted in the outcast community was such a hard thing. But I'll be damned if I didn't come out of it with hard skin and knowing who I am and knowing what I love to do. Yeah. So going through those trials and tribulations, I'm very thankful Like of all the things in skating that, have, that it's brought to my life. I'm so thankful for that. And that's like one of those things. Dude, I, I 100% back that and completely agree. I, I feel like had I not experienced that random like hate for, for trying to take something seriously and trying to do something like it, it does, it toughens up your skin and, and it makes you, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where you go through a negative situation and you can come out better on the other side, even though it really sucks being in it. When it, you come out at the end, you're like, oh. It really sucks being in it sometimes. Yes. And I mean, dude. A lot of times I see people, that's when they stop. Yes. You know? And yes. That's, and it's, you got to get through it. You got to keep going because in the end, it, it ends up being better because everything that I have been lucky enough to have now, it's because I did my own thing. It's because mm -hmm. I'm passionate about m what I am passionate about and I'm not following the crowd. Yeah. So it's, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. But it, and it's hard. Like, it's very difficult to not let other people's opinions it is. like sit and be like, oh, you're stupid for doing that. You, you know, you do. You're like, damn, am I? But and like, I don't, I don't think I am. But why do you think I am? The problem for like, me is I want to be friends with everybody. Yes. Yes. Especially in like the role winning community, which, you know, it's, it, this sounds like it's such a bad thing to be a part of. I've met all my best friends through rollerblading. I got into graphic design, you know, which is my, quote unquote career because of rollerblading. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, my life has been changed for the better. I've gotten to see cities and people and experience cultures and, and uh, countries that I would never have gone to all because of this thing. And I've met people all over the world that I'm best friends with. So like, I don't ever want anybody to, to, to hear that and think that like, oh, because I was outcast in the group of outcasts that it was a bad thing. Like, yeah, you know, part of me living here in this city now is because all my best friends are here through skating. Mm -hmm. I, I hang out with them outside of skating. Like, I'm so lucky to have that. So uh, skating for me has been everything. Like like I said, it, it took me to design work. It took me to different cities. It took me to college. Like it has been the underlying everything of my life. And I'm still passionate about it, if not more than ever. Yeah. So so let's let's jump back into the timeline when you're getting through high school and you're and you're identifying yourself as like, yep, cool. I love this skating thing. I'm really like, I'm continuing to be my own person. And you said that like, you know, when, when college pops up. So like, what does it look like when you get into those like adult kind of formative years of, all right, Hey, like, is it still, I'm going to pursue this kind of like dream passion of mine. Does it come in mind of like, I need to get like a real degree in something quote unquote. So I have that safety, like, like walk me through that aspect. So me being into rollerblading, the only thing that I ever wanted to do was to have a rollerblading clothing company. I thought as a kid, that was the coolest thing. I always bought t-shirts from bands, always bought t-shirts from, you know, skating companies. And that's where my love for graphic design started because I wanted to figure out how to print my own t-shirts. I wanted to figure out how to start my own skating company and come up with a logo and des different designs and colors. And I thought that was the coolest thing. So that was something I mentioned to my yearbook teacher in high school. So she put me into a couple graphic design classes. She got me on the yearbook staff, kind of learning how to use Photoshop, Illustrator, getting into those things of like, hey, like you also like video because you're into skating. Why don't you film the yearbook video? So it was like learning how to use Final Cut and learning how to use a camera. So during all of that and through my travels of going with my dad to different cities and different contests and like 
you know, being a kid traveling, um, I found out about the art institutes. So crazy what has happened to them now with them being a for-profit and being completely out of business. But uh, I either wanted to go to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh in Philadelphia, or Art Institute of uh, Pittsburgh or Art Institute of Philadelphia. So it ended up being that Pittsburgh was much closer to my hometown and it was the original Art Institute and their main focus was graphic design. So it was kind of like, oh, this is perfect. Let's go check it out. Go to that city. The minute you pull into Pittsburgh, I don't know if anybody's ever been there, there's a couple ways to come into the city, but it's essentially in a little valley and you have to take a bridge because it's covered by a river. So they call it the three rivers. You have to go over one of the bridges to get into the city. And as a kid who grew up in a small town, wanted to get out so badly of that small, tiny town and being a, a big city, coming over that bridge and then just seeing the skyline pop up out of nowhere. And Pittsburgh is one of the most unique cities I've ever been to. That was like, this is it. Like, I'm coming here. I don't care what, what other schools there are. I'm coming here. So luckily got in. Three days after my high school graduation, I moved to Pittsburgh. So I was packed and ready to go. I remember taking photos with my grandma inside the house and there were boxes in the hallway because I was like, I'm getting out of here. Like, I'm gone. Like, I'm out of here. And, you know, my parents were so supportive and they were so stoked. So I ended up going to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh at the time had a pretty decent skating scene. Um, It's where I met a lot of my best friends. My best friend that still films me now, I met him because he was my roommate in college. So once again, one of those, like, pivotal points in my life that set me off going forward. I wouldn't be living where I'm living or doing what I'm doing now if I hadn't been roommates with him in college. So college was a very, there was like almost refining myself. So like I said, with high school almost being full circle of me being into those same bands now and like almost dressing the same as I dressed in high school and like all those things, I got into a lot of different kinds of music and I was around different people and I was getting into different things and trying to find myself. And those years are probably some of my being most unhappy with who I was. Um, and I think that carried over a couple years after that too. Um, just trying different things and finding out different things and, you know, dressing a different way. And so, I, not to interrupt you, oh, but absolutely. why why do you say that it made you unhappy? Was it just because you were like unsure of maybe who you were, or because like when I hear that, you know, I'm hearing like you are involved in in skate culture and you've got that and you're and you're you know you're doing it, you're making it happen, you're pursuing it, and it's still it's for fun, yeah, and you're figuring out the graphic design, so you've got all these things. So I guess even from an outsider's point of view, it's like I feel like a lot of people could hear that and be like, well, wait. You've, but you've got the thing, and I think I bring this up because this is a situation I think a lot of people deal with, including myself. So I want you to speak on it. Is how how can you have the things that you want to have and be navigating those, but still be unhappy with who you are at the same time? It's almost like it flipped, right? Mm-hmm. Like I feel like that feeling of myself and what I was dealing with is what I should have been dealing with in high school. But I think because I had such a hard path. When I was younger, just you know, f- not feeling like I fit in and finding something and being like, this is me. like This is what I do. This is who I am. And then getting to college and being like, oh, I can get into anything I want to get into. So I got into like music that my friends were into that I probably didn't really like at the time, but I was getting into it because they were into it. And it was, I think you may have remembered too, this is when streetwear became a thing. Okay. When the phrase became a thing, when those companies became a thing, because I was so into t-shirts and clothing companies and streetwear had such a foothold in hip hop and you know like that was like when LRG and fitteds and you know that's when uh, Nike SBs and like shoe collecting became a thing that is very much not my style but I was into those things because I was like well I I didn't understand that you could be into streetwear and I could still be into the music that I was into it was well I'm into streetwear therefore I should be into this type of music or I should be dressing this type of way and for me looking back I think why I'm so unhappy with myself is because I know I wasn't being true to myself it's almost like you and obviously correct me if I'm wrong but just from an outsider's perspective it almost sounds like you found yourself in the culture that you you know in in high school years worked into but then you were confused by like the other changes that were happening after you were in that culture. Yeah. You were like, wait, I'm in it now. I'm not outside looking in, trying to make my way in. Now I'm in, 
but things are different. Yeah, I still so feel many, different. There's so many new things that I could be into. And right. it was like me just trying to figure out. And, and this is something I've said recently, talking with people about skating too. I understand why, uh, aside from me saying, this is what I do. I don't care what you think with my skating. I also think that time people kind of saw that I was like trying things that weren't necessarily myself. It's kind of like when, when you are who you are and you're unapologetic about it, I think people kind of champion that even if it's not their thing. Like I've had that said to me a lot of, I don't like the music that you use in your videos, in your rollerblading videos, but it fits you and it fits your skating. So I like to watch it. Normally I would put it on mute. So like I'm understanding that they're like, because it fits you. So that kind of, like I said, I was so unhappy with myself at that time because I was trying to f- like almost refine myself. Mm-hmm. And those were a lot of the formative years of me trying to figure out what to do, you know, figure out, well, if I want to do, you know, this t-shirt thing, w- what do you do? I, it's, I don't know who to talk to. Who, who do I find to, to teach me how to do these things? It's, you know, I, I pretty much taught myself illustrator. You know, I didn't, that was the one bad thing about going where I went to school is they didn't really teach us anything. It was kind of, this is what it is. Good luck. Can we, I love that you brought that up because I want to talk about that. What is, I'm just going to say this and I want you to riff on it. Yeah. yeah. Can you teach creativity? I feel like you can teach ways to make it easier to be creative, to help people unlock their creativity but you and I can both agree on this and understand there's certain people that just aren't creative and that's not a bad thing. You know, there's, there's people that I know that are so good with numbers or they're so technical with mechanics or, you know, things like that. I can do none of that. Mm -hmm. What I can do is be creative and that's fine. That's not a bad thing, but I feel like there's different ways that you can open it up and make it easier for yourself to be creative or be a better creative but I don't think you can teach it. And I, I, the reason I asked that is because, you know, you said you were like, yes, they taught me stuff, but they didn't really teach me anything. And I think that a lot of that comes from, you know, again, I've never, I didn't go to college for the graphic design that I can do or the video or photo or anything like that. But like, I feel like a lot of those programs, classes, whatever, they'll, they'll teach you, they teach you the technical side of like, you know, somebody that went to college for graphic design is going to know their way around Photoshop a lot better than I will. But that doesn't mean that they can be as creative. It doesn't mean that their ideas are going to flow in the same way. So they might know the shortcuts way quicker than somebody who didn't go. But that's like, it's like the technical side of like, here's how to do it. But that doesn't mean you will get the result. Breaking it down, it's almost like just because you know that yellow paint and blue paint make green paint doesn't mean you're going to make a good painting that has green in it. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's, yes. it, and that was one of my things too, was they did teach a lot of the technical things. I remember there was, I always use this example. I had a typography class and she was like, study a font type, whether it's, you know, sans serif for a specific font, just, just study something and just show me some examples, show me some examples of using it, whatever. And I thought it was so cool. I was like, you know, getting into streetwear and like collecting Nike SBs and all these things. I was like, graffiti is a font type. And I was like, that's so different than just me studying Times New Roman and being like, so-and-so created this and this this date and this is what it looks like <laughs> yeah. in italic. Like, no, I was like, this is such a cool thing that it's like, this is a font type and there's different styles. And I did this whole report of like, you know, this type of freehand is this, this type of block lettering is this. When people like, you know, do it on a free wall, like they're more likely to do this and tagging is more like this. And I went through this whole thing of why letters look the way they do. And I remember she looked at it and she goes, this isn't typography, D. Really? Without even going through oh, it or man. reading it. And that was one of those other like, uh, things that it's like, I was so passionate and excited about something and I was doing my own thing. And then for somebody to be like, this isn't how it's supposed to be. No. Yeah. It's like, well, I thought this was supposed to be like a creative thing. Like, and that was something that I kind of went through all through college was uh, make a logo for you know, this house this uh, construction company. And it's like, but what, like, what can we look like, farther? Like how farther can we go? Like what's like, you just want us to make it. And it was almost like if you did the homework, it was like, cool, check it off. Like you did it. Mm-hmm. It was never like, well, if you, you know, fit this into this and, and typography looks better when it's like this on a logo, there was, there was none of that. I had one teacher that got super deep into things of like, 
why would you use red in this logo? What does it, that emotion convey? Yeah, yeah. And he, and I always said he was the only teacher that went, and a lot of people didn't like him for that. Hmm. And he went so much deeper. He was, I remember we were, um, he was like, break a logo down to the, the tiniest shapes. He's like, so think of a, a very popular logo, minimize it to just the shapes. And I remember somebody had a bunch of triangles and he was like, what does that look like to you? And they're like, oh, it's a bunch of triangles. And he's like, no, go deeper. Why, like, what is it about those triangles? And they're like, well, they're blue. And he goes, okay, once again, go deeper. What does that blue mean? Is blue calming to you? You know, uh, are the triangles sharp and scary? He goes, if you're trying to make something sharp and scary, shouldn't those triangles be red? And that was kind of a mind-blowing thing. And that was literally the only thing in college that I ever learned that really carried over. I pretty much learned everything how I wanted to make it and do myself. I would get online and find these forums of like, I want to make something that looks like this. I would figure it out myself. My friend that I lived with, um, that I'm still friends with to this day, he was going to school for video. So I love skating and wanted to learn how to do video and skating. I would just watch him use his program. So then I got the program and I was like, well, when Hawk does this, the video turns out like this. So I taught so much of how I wanted to do things myself and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just kind of one of those things that it is what it was. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in the end, with everything that happened with me in school, um, my the graduation day, you had to put forth a portfolio of like what you did and you know whatever. Mine had so much of my work outside of school because nothing I did in school interests me. Yeah. So I had like mock-ups for t-shirts and it's like, well, my favorite clothing company looks like this, but this is how I would design it. And I got lucky that at graduation day, part of us doing these portfolios is they would have potential uh, jobs and employers come in and, and hire people or give them internships, whatever. There was a guy there that owned a t-shirt printing business. And he saw my stuff and he was like, are you really into t-shirts? And I said, yes. He goes, have you ever printed before? I was like, I haven't physically printed, but I understand the process, you know, through working with uh, skating companies and like doing freelance and, you know, just kind of learning because it was what I wanted to do and not learning in school. I had figured out like, you know, how to do a screen and how to uh, emulsion and like all these processes. And, you know, I told him, I was like, I haven't physically done it, but I understand it. And I got a job off of that. So my first job out of college was working for a t-shirt printing business doing their design work. That's so sick. Yeah, so it ended up working out and it was such a weird time for me because I was really getting into skating. That's when I wanted to get sponsored. Was like at, towards the end of college was, you know, I would love to get sponsored and and go somewhere with skating. I would love to like travel and film and like do all these things and I was like so passionate about it. And at that same time it was like I wanted to get into t-shirt things and like design for clothing companies and it worked out that while i was working at that t-shirt printing business i got sponsored by a clothing company and then he found out he's like wait you do design work why don't we design a line so then i got to design the line for that clothing company and after that is when everything started for me so that was the big thing in my life as far as design work that kind of set it off i love that you just had like a, a little winning streak right there it's like, and, and I also love not, not to like go backwards any, but like, I feel like hearing that, like what I love is that that trajectory technically happened because of your choosing, your doing. So what I mean I by that, that is, yes, you were in school for graphic design and yes, that because of that, they were bringing in people like a little kind of job fair sort of thing where, you know, they, they look at your work and see if you can get hired. However, what you did is what got you hired. What you did, the fact that you chose to continue to be yourself, to continue to create the things that are inspiring to you and show here's who I am as a creator. Here's who I am more specifically as a designer. That's what caught someone's attention. And that to me, I love that out of that whole like, like domino effect. I feel like that is very much how my whole life has been. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of one thing leads to another and me doing things how I want to do them or doing things my way, whether it's up or down, good or bad, it kind of all leads into something. And see that like, not to trail off too much, but like, I feel like I use that comparison or analogy to luck a lot of the times. So and maybe you and I have talked about this before and I'm guilty, you know, everybody's guilty of being like, oh, that person's so lucky. I cannot believe they just got that opportunity. They're so lucky. There's so many things to happen before that point. Yes. And while, sure, you know, somebody who for sure is friends with the right person or is friends with the friend of the right person, 
Sure, you can attribute some of that to like, well, luckily that person hit that other person up that got them that opportunity. However, they they got themselves to knowing person number one that introduced them to person number two. You know what I mean? So while someone can sit and be like, dude, you know, let's jump in our time machine one more time and go back to like talking to like college stuff. And, and let's say there's a classmate that's like, dude, you're so lucky. I can't believe you got that job freaking from doing your graphic design. I was in the same class, dude. You got lucky that person hired you. You put yourself in that position though. And I think that's like where, what I've tried to remind myself a lot of the times. Cause again, I get, I get annoyed when I see somebody get an opportunity or something that, that I didn't get that I'm like, Oh, they're so lucky, but it's not that they're lucky. It's they, you know, the classic, like what's, what's on a lot of streetwear, like t-shirts, you make your own luck. And I, and I really have like grown to subscribe to that idea yeah. that you put yourself in the position for quote unquote luck to happen. You know, because like I, and we've talked about this before, I don't like networking events. And obviously right now in the current world, they're not really happening. But in general, I'm not a big fan of networking events because I don't like the idea of elevator pitches. I don't like the idea of going in and trying to sell myself. I'd rather whatever I do speak for itself and that attracts the right people. Or if I am at a networking event, I want to sit one-on-one with somebody and get to know them rather than be like, hey, you know, I do this thing and I'd really like for you to hire me for it. Wouldn't that be great? So the point I'm making is that, you know, there's a lot of people I know that get to do a lot of cool things and I'm like, oh, I wish I I could do that. I wish I could do that. But the issue is, is that that opportunity came from them going to a networking event and meeting and talking to a person who happened to connect them with that. So it's not that they were lucky and that just popped up out of nowhere. They put themselves in the circumstance that led that to happen. You know what I mean? Like I guarantee I would know a lot more people that could benefit me in some ways if I was a little bit more of an outgoing person. If I went to more networking events when they happened in the city or I got more involved in this or whatever it is. And I love talking to people. I love meeting people. But like the, the, it's like the, that's the extrovert part of me, but the introvert part of me is the one that schedules those meetings. You know what I mean? So I it's feel like, like creatives have so much of those two things. We yes. have the extroverted side and we have the introverted side. And I feel like a good creative realizes that mm-hmm. and kind of plays off both. You got to balance it. Exactly. You got to figure out how to balance it. And that's when, you know, getting into the whole luck thing where it's like, again, as I we were can, saying, like it's it's silly because, like you said, it really is on so many shirts. But it's you you are making your own luck. And I've always said this: if you want something bad enough, you will make it happen. It may not be how you imagined it. It may not be. You may not realize it at that time. But like I've always said, looking back at my life, and my mom gets so mad at me for this. Everything I do leads into something else. So it's like if I'm like at my lowest point, or like something bad is happening, it's become a joke of her being like. Well, if you're in a bad spot, you know something great is about to happen because that's how it happens for you. Yeah, I love that. And it's and it's yeah. once again, like you said, you know, somebody may see that as, oh, well, you're just lucky in your life. You have a lot of luck. It's like, well, but at the same time, if you're not putting yourself into these situations of like, you know, like you said, if I hadn't put all of that stuff with the t-shirt design thing and with the clothing companies and these things that I was passionate about and I loved in that portfolio that guy would have come and never seen it. He may not have hired anybody because he's like, oh, well, I need somebody for my t-shirt business. I don't know anybody. So was that luck or was that perfect timing kind of thing? Was Mm -hmm. it, you know, setting myself up when the opportunity is ripe? Yes. So, and I, and that's one of those things that I feel like if you stick to your guns and stay true to who you are, things will happen. They may not happen when you want them to happen. They may not happen how you want them to happen. But if you're true to yourself and you are doing what you want to do, you will be successful. It's kind of like the, you know, put out into the world what you want and what you are. Absolutely. You will attract those sort of things. Yes, absolutely. And I feel like that, silly enough, I've never thought about it until you've said that, but I feel like that's also been a big part of my life. It's like, I want to do this. Here I am trying this thing. And then the opportunity comes my way. Yeah. So it was like, well, I want to design for clothing companies and the clothing companies start coming the way. You know, I want to start designing for bands. It's like, well, I'll just start trying. And then one happens and then they all start coming in. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, um, it all just starts rolling in. It's a domino Uh, effect. Domino effect. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So, so how long were you at the print shop 
And then what were you doing during that time to continue adapting and evolving yourself? So I went to school. I got a bachelor's degree in three years. It was an accelerated program. So I was in college from 2006 to 2009. So 2009, 2010-ish was when I was at that uh, t-shirt printing place. So around that time, I really started to get more into skating. I really wanted to, you know, hey, like I would like to get better and get sponsored and like and just do things. It wasn't like I'm going to go pro. I'm going to be the best. It wasn't that. It was I love skating so much. I want to be involved somehow. Like like I said like I got hooked up with a, a clothing sponsor. It's like, "Well, can I design for you?" cuz that's what I love to do and that's what I want to do. And lucky enough, like they let me and that led to other jobs coming my way and other skating companies saying like, "Hey, you designed for this. Can you design this for us?" So, I was there for about a year. Started to realize that it wasn't where I wanted to be. Um we were living about, I want to say maybe like 40 minutes outside of the city. And then my job was like another 20 minutes. So I was like an hour outside of the city. So kind of in the suburbs, I'm trying to skate and do all these things and film and be involved in skating. And it's kind of hard when you're out in the middle of nowhere. So like, once again, it's like that small town thing. If like I had to drive an hour into the city to see my friends and skate and do whatever, wasn't happy about that. Just didn't see myself really going anywhere at this job. Um, kind of was always going to be the new guy was always going to end up being like low on the totem pole, which is not a bad thing. I just wanted something different. So I wanted to do my own thing. I wanted to do freelance. I was starting to get, I was starting to get graphic design jobs for skating companies. I was like, this is amazing. This is exactly what I want. So I kind of took a step back, ended up kind of moving home with my parents for a little bit, trying to figure out where I was, where I wanted to do, what was going on. And then after that, I ended up moving to North Carolina. So the person I was with at the time, she had family that was in North Carolina. She wanted to be closer to them. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was like, well, if you're moving, I'll go with you. So once again, one of those pivotal moments in my life, I was in North Carolina for about a year and a half. It was the most unhappy I have ever been in my life because I was in such a bad relationship. And I was stuck in a lease, couldn't get out of the lease, was uh, doing shipment work at a retail place because it was just the, the job that I could find was trying to do freelance. Freelance wasn't really happening or not getting as much as I wanted to because I was just starting out. But what I will say about that time, because I was in such a bad spot in my life and I was so miserable, I skated all the time so hard with such passion. And I've said, if I hadn't been in that terrible relationship and in a terrible spot, I don't think I would ever have gotten decent at skating. I would have been okay. I would have like done some cool stuff, but that was like a formative year for me for rollerblading. I would get out of work and I would skate until I would go home and go to sleep. If it was the weekend, I would wake up and I would go skate. Whether that was with people by myself, I would go to the skate park and literally train because I didn't want to be at home. I didn't want to be miserable. I was in a miserable relationship. We didn't like each other. You know, it was just one of those situations. So towards the end of that year, um, my best friend had passed away. I knew that I was getting out of the lease. I knew that I could go and do whatever I wanted after that. I wasn't stuck there. So towards the end of that, I, this is like when I said like the streetwear thing was becoming a thing. And this is when t-shirt blogs were becoming a thing because before Instagram, and you may remember this, Ross, before Instagram and social media were a thing, t-shirt websites and t-shirt blogs were how clothing companies got out. Right. So there are multiple ones that, you know, if you were an up and coming indie brand, if you got on one of these sites, that's how people found out about you. Aside from like, obviously like regular guerrilla marketing and like going to, you know, pop-up shops, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I being into those things and being in a streetwear, I was like, I can do this. I was like, why can't I do this? So me knowing that I wasn't going to be living in this place anymore, knowing that I was going to be leaving, I started my first clothing company. So aside from me putting everything into skating, I put everything I had into this clothing company. And it was called Lumen. And a lot of people that remember me remember Lumen and remember this owl. So this owl logo that I made, it, for some reason, it still connects with people. I know people that have it tattooed on their bodies. When people think of of me, a lot of the times, aside from the role budding thing, they think of Lumen and the Owl. So the Owl has become a motif in my life and through everything I do to the point that it is almost like the Owl itself has almost become like a secondary like brand 
for myself. Yeah. So on a lot of my wheels that I have, like my my skating wheels that I have, my signature wheels, there that's the owl has been all on all of them. Mm-hmm. So um, that time, like I said, was another one of those formative periods of me being like, I'm unhappy. What do I need to do? I'm gonna go all in on the things that I love. So before we go any further, I want you to talk on the point of like how how difficult is the balance to push through into finding something positive out of such a negative situation? Because I feel like that- It's easier. That, that scenario, so it's easier. It's okay. easier. And this is something with the last year and with Corona and me being in a good spot in my life. This is something that my girlfriend and I had just recently talked about. I almost got a little lazy during Corona because life is so good and so easy. I don't have any reason to force myself or push myself to do things. Things are going good. I'm in a good spot. I'm very happy. But also I've taken a step back on a lot of the things I love because there's no need or like, to to put it in perspective, when I was there and I was so unhappy, I was like, I need something to get me out of this. I need something to put my heart and soul into so I'm not thinking about uh, you know, this unhappy period of my life. So, and this will play in as we continue on with, you know, what I've done in my timeline, other points in my life where I was so unhappy is when there's such a massive change because I'm forced to do what I need to do to make myself happy and really go the extra mile of making it happen Mm -hmm. and having that passion and that desire and work ethic to be like, I'm doing this because I have nothing else. Right. So I'm very lucky to have grown up in a good family, in a good town, had a great life. I understand why there's so many moguls and rappers and people in bands, when they come from nothing, why they become so successful. Because when you're in that pit of despair and nothingness, having something to try to get you out, you put everything into it. As opposed to somebody who's happy and has it all, they have no need to put their everything and their all into it because they have they have things already. When you have nothing, that's when you go all in on something and you I feel like are the most passionate about it. Yeah. Yeah. So those those points in my life and that that was a big one. That was me saying I love skating so much, I'm going all in. It's all I'm going to do. All I've ever wanted to do is start a clothing company. Why am I waiting? I'm unhappy, I'm going for it. And that set up so many more opportunities and things in my life to come after that. Why do you think it's so hard for people to be able to identify like, Hey, something that I'm passionate about or something that I could pursue could get me out of this negative situation. Is it just because our minds get so clouded with like things are bad right now that it's kind of, you can't see what's past the clouds in a way of like, if yeah. I just got there, I could maybe make it better yeah. because I feel like so so often, and, and I have certainly done this, and I'm sure that the cycle will continue throughout everyone's life. You, you always are going to find yourself in a bad predicament, bad yep. situation. You know, just a handful of months ago, I hated uh, doing video, hated doing video production, but I found a way to refocus and repurpose my own purpose. Well, why do you think that's so difficult for us? Why, why do you think I feel it's- like for a lot of people in general, especially at this time, this culture, everything we have, self realization is not as big of a topic and a thing that people are focused on. Me and, you know, as we talked about this with like me being in high school and me in college and like realizing when I'm happy, when I'm not unhappy, I know a lot about myself. I like self-realize a lot of things. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. I'm honest with myself. I feel like a lot of people don't do that. I feel like a lot of people are either stuck in their ways. A lot of people are, they don't know who they are. They don't know what they want. They just know that they're stuck in a situation and it sucks. They don't know what their passion is. They don't know how to get out of it. Some people don't have hobbies. Some people don't have passions. It's so obvious to me being in the communities that I'm involved with and the people that I know, every single person has something they're passionate about, even if it's just skating. Even if they don't have a spectacular life or a spectacular job or anything, they still love skating. So that's one thing they're passionate about. Mm -hmm. But most people in skating are so different and outcast and creative that, you know, like similar to me, like I love skating, but I love design work. I love branding. I love clothing. Those are other things I'm passionate about. Like my friends that skate that film, they love film. They love video. Like 
there's other passions. And I have come to realize, and this is a very sad thing, that a lot of people just don't know what they love. They don't know what they're passionate about. They don't have hobbies. Yeah. And in this day and age, it's so easy to just disconnect and find things to numb yourself. It's easy to get on Netflix and watch a series. My hobby is watching TikTok videos, you know, like as that opposed quarter, you know. to, well, I'm kind of into this thing. Maybe I'll go take a class. Yeah. It's like, nah, I'll just stay at home and I'll watch this Netflix series. It's, I'll just scroll through social media. It numbs me. It's, you know, oh, I just want, I'm coming home from work. I just want to sit on the couch and scroll. Mm-hmm. And I feel like with this day and age, it's even less uh, of a thing than, than it normally would be. And I've been lucky enough to know from a very young age what I loved and what I was going to do. And I wasn't going to do anything else. Like if I had to get a side job to be able to keep skating, I'll get a side job. If the job I'm at isn't paying enough, well, I'll get a second job. If I'm not going to make rent this month, well, I put it out there that I'm looking for freelance jobs. You make it work. I feel like that self-realization and even, and again, just having hobbies that can or cannot be a passion, it doesn't matter. I feel like that is is the big thing that I feel like a lot of people miss because, and that's something that I, I want more people to identify because I've had so many conversations with people who are like, oh man, you, you, you know, well, you do so many things and, and it's just because you're creative and blah, blah, blah. And it's like they almost set whatever they want to do in this weird, different realm where it's like they look at me and they're like, well, you do video and photo and graphic design and, and you know, all that sort of stuff. So I wish I had one thing. Yeah. So it's like, well, those are things that, you know, you're, you're trying to make a career out of those or you're doing those when it's like all it comes down to, I have really hard days that involve all of those things. Again, luckily I have the drive and I'm passionate enough to figure out how I make those things work and, and adapt and evolve. But at the core of it, it's because I'm trying to figure out who I am and make myself happy with who I am. People don't realize there's hard days. Like, yeah, there's days that I have been like, I hate skating. Like there's so much negativity. Why am I bothering to do this? Freelance. I hate freelance. I'm not getting any jobs. I'm screwed. I'm not going to be able to pay rent this month or I'm so busy. I don't have time for anything else. People just say, oh, well, you're doing what you want to do. It's got to be easy. It's like, no, it's it's not easy, but because I love it, I'm going to push through. And at the core, you know who you are and who you want to be. And that's kind of, I think, what we're, what we're talking about is just like knowing what kind of life you want. And I do not mean I want a creative life. I want a millionaire's life. I want a famous person's life. It's more so just what are the things that make you feel good? And it doesn't have to be a creative venture. You know, that's something that I feel like a lot of people almost put this uh, screen door in front of when I'm talking to them about any of this sort of stuff is they're like, they're thinking that, well, Ross is speaking from his perspective on pursuing video or pursuing creative. And I'm just not that. I don't want to be a creative dude. So don't tell me to pursue my goals. That's not what it is. Whatever your goal is, if it's fitness, if it's baking, if it's having a rad family, having a cool house, living in the place that you want to live in. If you've never tried a sport before and you're like, I think I would be really interested in that. It's as easy as joining a league and, mm-hmm. and testing it out. And like, I understand for a lot of people that's easier said than done, but it's just going out and doing that thing. And it's like, I, I feel so bad for people that, that I see like that, that don't have a hobby or a passion yeah. and they don't realize that why they may be so unhappy in their life is because they don't have something. It, you can have a normal job. You can have a nine to five doing yep. absolutely whatever, but, and it doesn't even have to be creative. If you like coming home and finding out facts about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and that's your and you like collecting Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's Dope. not creative, but if that's what you love, you have something that you love. It makes you happy. It makes you happy. Like it doesn't have like you said it doesn't have to be creative. It doesn't have to be I'm going to be the best at this thing. I'm going to turn this into my job. If you even if you want to do something creative, if you want to start doing photo, you don't have to quit your job and try to become a freelance photographer. You can just pick up a camera and go shoot stuff for fun because it's something to do because you love it. There's this saying, and I, I don't know where I heard it, where I found it, but it, I, I love it because it's it's uh, the question is, who are you, or what do you think about yourself when there's no one else in the room? So who are you when no one else is around? And I love the idea of that. And that's kind of, in a, in a trickle-down way, kind of what we're talking about. Just who are you at your, your core? What are the things that you like? What are the things that you're passionate about? So, you know, when you're, you know, let's say, let's use, use us as an example. 
you're around, you and I are going to talk about the similarities that we have. Oh man, we both had clothing lines, we both graphic design, and what was your client like? Well, my client was like this, and what is business and freelance like, and all that sort of stuff. And of course, we're going to talk about anything else, but we've got that common ground. But who am I when you leave? I know that no matter who walks in this room, I want to have the same conversation with them, not revolving around business, freelance, creative. I want to have the same conversation because I'm interested in learning who people are because that invigorates me. It it energizes me, right? I love doing this podcast because I love communicating with people and telling stories. So when everybody else leaves after, let's say, a video production, who am I when everyone's gone? I'm not so much attaching myself to like that specific video production is all that I am and who I am. And if it doesn't go perfect, I suck. And I say that having went through that exact yeah. <laughs> attachment. I say that now looking from the outside in, it, seeing myself get so attached to, well, that music video didn't go freaking perfect and it doesn't look exactly how I wanted it to look. I suck. I am this a is failure. This going to work. How dare I? But then I had to identify, well, wait, what do I like out of that? And I'm not going to attach myself to that single thing. So not to keep using myself as an example. I oh, think, but I'll go to a baseline of that, like the baseline of my life. You're saying, you know, be who you are when nobody else is around. Find out who that person is and be that person unapologetically. Mm -hmm. If you love something, love it. If your friends don't love it, screw them. They're your friends. They should understand. Yes. And that's, like I said, that's like a baseline of my life is if I've been into a band and nobody thinks they're cool, I don't care. If I'm doing a, a, a skating trick that is not the cool trick at the moment, I don't care. It's fun. I'm going to do it and I'm going to be unapologetic about it. I don't care what you think. Yeah. And I know that's hard and it's easy for me to say that because that's my personality and who I am. But that is one thing that I can give to people is that if you are, if you realize, if you finally realize who you are and you do that self-realization and you're like, I am this person, I love this. I want to be like this. Be that person 100%. Don't, don't shy away from, I don't know. People might not like that hobby or I don't know. And as rollerbladers, we deal with this. I don't know. I don't want to tell those people that I rollerblade. Like, oh, you skateboard? No, I rollerblade. It's yeah. different. It's no, I'm going to be unapologetic about it. And when you are, people are like, whoa, that's cool. Mm-hmm. And seeing that change the past couple of years when I've been like, this is what I do and I love it. People are so much more willing to be like, that's awesome. Tell me about it. Yeah. That's awesome. That's very interesting as opposed to, well, I don't know. Yes. You know, it's, it's, be yourself unapologetically. And that's and even to circle back around the whole reason we went on that side tangent is because that is how you can help yourself be happy. Yes. Is if you are happy when no one else is around, who are you sitting alone in the room? Are you happy with that person? And if you're not, what are even the tiniest things? I'm not saying go be a millionaire. I'm not yep. saying start a business. I'm not saying anything huge. But the smallest detail of what makes you, you, can you find a way to be happy and satisfied with that? Because then that will help you, I think, figure everything out. It, that'll create the domino effect into every other web of your life. And it's silly, but you know, Nike just do it. Gary V quotes, mm-hmm. you can't make other people happy until you are happy. Yes, 100,000%. So back into the timeline. So... You're, leaving, you're, you're figuring out how you need to be Yeah, happy. leaving North Carolina, I think this is like 2012, went back to Pittsburgh. Went back to Pittsburgh with a clothing line, went back to Pittsburgh knowing I love skating. Like these are the things that I want to do. Um, had a very good year in Pittsburgh. Um, the, the clothing company I had was doing great at a time. Uh, I wasn't even doing freelance. My job was the clothing company. I was making enough just doing it, and that left me open to, to skate whenever I wanted. So can we, can we talk about that a little yeah, bit more absolutely. in detail before we go into the bigger picture? Yeah, yeah. So, so guide me through starting the clothing line and, and getting, it to a, getting it to a point where it is your job. So I had a very specific vision for it. I knew what I wanted it to be, what I wanted it to look like. One, my dad said one of my problems with it was that I – almost made it too deep. Like it had a deeper meaning. And a lot of the times people were just like, I like that design. It looks cool. And I'm like, yeah, but there's such a deeper meaning. So good thing and a bad thing. But like I said, this was the time of like t-shirt blogs. So it was going out and shooting a lookbook, creating a lookbook on your website, sending that to these blogs. And then that's how you got a lot of sales. I was very lucky because I was so 
connected to the rollerblading scene and I was starting to become more connected with the music scene. So this is when I was slowly getting back into like finding myself and being happy with who I was. It was going back into getting back into the music that I actually liked, getting back into dressing how I actually liked and still being like, I can listen to a hardcore band and be into streetwear. It's okay. Like that's kind of what it's all about anyway. And, and, Oh, seeing that over the past couple of years of there being so many different genres of streetwear brands and like different clothing companies, it's like, there's one for everybody now. But at the time it wasn't like that. It was like, you know, this one's kind of like more hip hop. This one's kind of EDM. This one's into shoes. There you go. So me kind of realizing like I can do whatever I want to do again. So that was also a positive of me kind of connecting all of these things. So the first two lines did well for what it was. And it was me mostly selling to friends, friends from high school, friends from college, you know, other skaters. I luckily have a base group of people that I could sell what I'm doing to. So I was lucky in that sense. I understand somebody that's starting a business and doesn't have anybody. Like if you're starting a clothing company and you don't have a community to sell to, I could understand where it was hard. I got lucky. Going back to what you said, maybe I not so lucky because I put my work into those communities and having things, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. So who who knows? But that being said, those two things, first two lines did well. Um, I want to say it was like maybe the third or fourth line I did, I started sponsoring the bands that I liked. So I started messaging bands that I listened to. I started messaging bands that were, I may not have liked totally, but that were on Warp Tour that may not have a clothing sponsor. So that was kind of my in for multiple things. That was my in for getting the clothing company out to the group of people that I wanted to sell it towards, that I didn't have any connection with that community. And it was also me putting feelers out there for, well, hey, so-and-so band that likes my clothes that I'm sponsoring. If you like the way those designs look, why can't I design your merch? So that was kind of how I got into that a little bit too. Um, So that was 2013, 2014-ish. Towards the end of that year, my lease was up and I kind of just wanted to travel. So I essentially lived out of my car and on friends' couches for, I want to say maybe like four or five months. It was that summer into that fall. So I would go to New York City for two weeks, stay with a friend, film for some skating projects, stay until my favorite band came through. Watch them at that date, and then it's like, well, they're going to Pittsburgh after that day. Well, cool, I just left Pittsburgh. I'll go back and stay with friends there, watch them there. Well, then they're going up to Cleveland. I've got friends in Cleveland, I'll go up there too. So I started following people around, bands that I was, you know, friends with or knew or liked. You're just kind of, I lived a very nomadic life for a little bit. Yeah, I was going to say, you made your own just yeah. like little and it was just trips kind of, and tour. And it was never like, this is what I want to do. It was just kind of like what was right at the time. Mm-hmm. So, and it was one of those things like I was in Erie at a friend's house and they were like, hey, what are you doing? I was like, well, I'm going home. I'm just here for the day. To like, I can't even remember why I was there. I'm just here for the day. I got to go home. They're like, well, we're going to see a sold out show tomorrow. We have extra tickets. They're one of your favorite bands. Do you want to come? And it was, well, I don't have clothes to wear. Uh, I've got no food. Let's go to Target. I'll pick up a new outfit and I'll get some food and let's go to that show. And then from that show, it's like, hey, you're near us in Detroit. Why don't you come up to Detroit and skate for a couple of days? Well, screw it. I got nothing else going on. So, and that's how that whole time period went for a very long time. So, just doing normal skating things. I had a, f- a few sponsors that I was doing videos for and kind of like focusing on, but it was nothing, nothing big or crazy. It was, you know, just something I still love to do. Um, towards the end of that year, I went home for a little bit, was skating a skate park that I grew up skating. It was one of the first skate parks I ever went to. So I had this place dialed in, like grew up as a kid, coming back to it, more skilled, you know, flying around, whipping around, doing whatever. Little kid on a scooter comes flying at me. I go to step out of his way. When I step out of his way, I just step weird on my skate, slip back, go right to my head. Not even skating, not even doing anything. I get a terrible concussion. Knock myself out. I'm like, whoa, that was bad. Like, should have just let the kid run into me, picked him up, whatever, ran him over, something. That sucked. So I'm sitting there and everybody's like, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. No big deal. Just a little woozy, hit my head, whatever. So I go home and I'm like, my head really hurts. Like, this is really bad. Luckily I'm home. I'm at my parents' house. Thank God. So day goes by, go to go do something, put cologne on, can't smell anything. Like, huh, that's weird. Spray it in the air. Can't smell it. I'm like, 
I don't have a sinus infection. There's no weird things going on in the air, like don't have allergies or anything. What's going on? So I just remember this so vividly. I sprayed a ton of cologne on a shirt, go to sniff it, can't smell anything. Go downstairs, freaking out a little bit, eat something, can't taste anything. Concussion made me lose my sense of smell and taste. Wow. So I had already been very freaked out because my dad was like, if you have a concussion, you probably shouldn't sleep. Like, got checked out by a, a friend that did. And she's like, looked at my eyes. She's like, you're okay. Like, no big deal. A friend that did medical stuff. So I was very freaked out. So it was really scary. I was at a point where I didn't know what I was doing. I was traveling around, you know, in my car. Like, luckily, I was home at my parents when this happened. That was one of those, another life moment that it was like, what do I do going forward? I was looking for somewhere to live. I was looking to go do something. Right around that time, a friend of mine from Baltimore was like, hey, know you've always wanted to come to Baltimore. Know you're kind of like doing your own thing, living out of your car, like hanging out at friends' houses, traveling, whatever. We're getting a house in Baltimore. We need another person. Do you want to come? Once again, set myself up, perfect situation. So I moved to Baltimore. So because of that injury, I was very nervous to skate. I was very kind of unsure, still love skating, still did it every once in a great while. But upon moving to Baltimore, I found my first group of friends that were outside of the skating community and outside of music. These were people that were DJs, sushi chefs, random things that I never ever would have people that I never would have met because I was in this social group in Baltimore, just the way that culture is there and the way that city is, it's almost like a small, big city where everybody knows everybody. And it was like, oh, you're creative. You do this. Well, so-and-so that does this needs a graphic designer. It's like, well, my friend shoots photos. Can you go model for them? And it's just, it was a crazy time for me because I've never been involved in anything outside of, you know, music design, skating, whatever, to have that group of people. And during that time, I got very, very, very into fitness and bodybuilding. So I say that as a specific thing because once again, that set up what happened in my life the next few years moving forward. So instead of going skating every day, there was nobody in Baltimore that skated besides my two roommates, one of who left two months into being there. The other roommate had a terrible knee injury one of the first times we went out skating. I was by myself. There was nobody to skate with. On top of me just having an injury, I was like, I'm kind of good. Like, I'm happy. Like, I, I was designing for bands that I loved. Like, and I think this is something that you can attest to, like doing freelance, especially in music. I've done a lot of amazing work for, for bands that I don't really listen to. Mm-hmm. Completely cool. That's fine. It's still music. It's still the design work and the style that I love. But a lot of my favorite bands that I love, they either do their own design work. It's not totally the style. Somebody in the band knows how to do design work just, you know, never really connected. For me traveling out of my car and just meeting people, I started to design for the bands that I loved. Started to design for bands that were on Warp Tour. I was doing freelance for doing merch design full time now. Also still had my clothing company. And does that, sorry to interrupt you, but does that come from, you know, you doing all these freelance jobs for, you're designing for all these bands. Is that literally just because yeah, I was just around and I, I met and became friends with Absolutely. these bands. So I yep. was the go-to like, yeah. oh, hey, Stefan yep. Design. And so. sorry for not getting more into detail with no, that. No, no, no. But no. that's kind of what happened. It mm-hmm. was my best friend, one of my best friends from Amsterdam who skates had come over and was like, hey, I'm filming for Backtrack, one of their live music videos. Do you just want to come? Because I know you love them and everybody on this tour and do second camera with me. Absolutely. Out of that, I ended up doing t-shirt designs for them. Out of that, I ended up doing t-shirt designs for other bands on that bill. And that's the stuff, that was the type of music that I loved and still love, but it was less of me, a band just wanted something and I did it. And it was more of me being like, this is my favorite band. I get to put lyrics that mean something to me on this design for one of my favorite bands. And it just snowballed. Yeah. So um, got to do a lot of, I, I remember that year I did, it was either four or five bands spreads for Warp Tour. And I thought that was the coolest thing. I was so happy. I had a social life. I had all these things going on. And instead of skating being my, my, my focus of like physicality, because that's something in my life that I've always needed. I've always needed a creative outlet and I've always needed a physical outlet. Luckily, skating is both of those things. So granted, I also have other creative outlets on the side, but me being, I've been an athlete all my life. Like I said, like growing up, I was very into soccer. I was very into basketball. I'm into training. I'm into fitness but I just never saw it as a path. 
And with skating kind of being out of the way and not being as important, I got heavy into fitness and bodybuilding at that time. So it was just what I was around, the culture, everything. So towards the end of that year in Baltimore, my lease being up, my favorite fitness streetwear brand, which also was not a thing at the time, you know, a, a fitness brand that did cool t-shirts. It was just, that, that wasn't a thing then. So this is about 2015, 2016. They were looking for a graphic designer. They were about an hour and a half away from Baltimore. I was like, well, this is cool. I'm going to apply. Never going to hear back from them. Put in an application, went about my life. You know, lease is almost up. Ah, I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe we'll just renew the lease, stay in Baltimore another year. Like, wasn't really feeling it. Was kind of wanting to do something else. If I wanted to stay there, I wanted like an actual job. I wanted like a full-time design job. I, wa I wanted something. I wanted more. So sure enough, I hear back from them. They're in Reading, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour and a half outside of Baltimore. So I'm like, you know, that wouldn't be too bad. It's kind of close to Baltimore still. I can come back and see my friends. If I, you know, want to do something, go to a show. It's not, it's an hour and a half, whatever. Like, that's no big deal. Like, I grew up driving four hours to go skate with my dad, just to go skate, period. Hour and a half is nothing. So I go, I get the job. It is my dream job. So this place that I worked for, it was a, uh, a couple, a married couple, she was the basically the number one female bodybuilder. And this is when YouTube and vlogs had kind of slowly started to become a thing. He was famous on uh, YouTube for doing fitness blogging stuff. So they had a streetwear-ish fitness brand. They had a gym. They had a drift racing team. And they had a supplement company. And they needed a graphic designer to work for all of those things. So I'm like, this is it. So imagine Rob Dyrdek's Fantasy Factory for bodybuilders. That's where I worked. I thought this was it. This is my life from here on out. This is my dream job. This is amazing. Like I'm working for one of my idols. This guy is who I want to design my life after. So granted, I would like mine to be a little bit like I was the kid there that listened to hardcore. I was the kid that rolled like, hey, the, the guy that rollerblades the, the gym, haha. -ha. So I still had my thing that was going on, but I was like, I, I was looking at houses. I was like, this is it. Like, this is my dream job. I'm done. I've made it. I'm so happy. So around that time, for some reason, there was a bigger skating scene in Reading, PA than there was in Baltimore. So I started skating more. The sponsor that I had, I started to do way more with because I had more time because I was a creative at a creative full-time job. It was, oh, Stefan, you want to go to that contest? Dude, who cares? Get out of work early on Friday. Here's a camera. Go film yourself at the contest, dude. So I'm like, this is great. This is, this is what I want to do. So I started skating more. I started taking skating a little more seriously because I was set in my other aspects of life. So while I was at this job, I was not allowed to do work for anything else. So I was under contract, no freelance, no work for bands, nothing for skating, no creative work at all. At first, I'm like, well, who cares? I'm doing the exact type of work that I want to do. So a couple months in, I started to realize that I was making, I remember I had a file of over 200 t-shirt designs from the time that I had got there until you know a couple months in. Not one had been used. So it kind of made me like, why am I here? So then it was like, well, we don't really need you for design work. Let's have you manage the gym. Why don't you manage our social media? This is when Instagram had started becoming a thing. This is when businesses were allowed on Instagram. It, this is when things were picking up on social media. So I'm like, all right, cool. Well, I'll learn about social. Everything I know about social now that is so important to my brand, my skating, everything, I learned there. I became a much better designer because of the things that I learned there, like we were talking about earlier, as far as like programs and things like that. The other graphic designer that was there, he was like the head creative. It was just me and him. He did not grow up doing design work. He kind of did the thing where I want to learn how to be creative. I want to get into this. So he taught himself everything. The little tips and tricks that he taught me when I was like, hey, here's this thing that I made. He was like, well, can you set the file up like this? And he would show me things. And I'm like, that's genius. I'm like, that makes so much more sense. So my workflow now as a creative comes a lot from him. And I don't think I ever got to tell him that. But I learned a lot. That was such a formative year of my life going from, this is it, I'm done, I've made it. This is all I care. Like, I will tell you this, I thought that I was done. Like, I could 
work at this job for a couple years and retire. Like it was that good. It was that amazing. Like I thought this was it. So like I was saying, when I got into it and realizing like, hey, like I'm, none of my designs are being used. Isn't that why you hired me? Well, we'll have you manage the gym. Don't worry about it. Film, you're, you're good at filming, film the events and film all the social media work at the gym. It's like, I like filming. I film skating all the time. I can use the same camera. And it was the same thing. It's like, well, if you go over to the gym at nine o'clock and film that stuff, you're done for the day. Go skate. I'm like, okay, this is great. Like best situation possible for me. But then it was, well, we don't need you doing that. We're going to have you go and do this. We're going to have you go and do this. And you know this too, as a creative, when you have, I had no creative outlet because I wasn't even allowed to make something and post it on Instagram at this place. Hmm. If I was like, oh, hey, look at this photo of me skating with this cool logo that I made just to put on top of it. And I posted it on Instagram, I would have gotten fired. Hmm. So I was stuck in such a hard contract with this. And it's like, if this is my creative outlet and you're not letting me be creative, I don't, like, what am I supposed to do? So then again, I got deep into skating. I was in the best shape of my life, obviously, working at a bodybuilding company, getting fitness supplements and all these things for free, having a g- like gym access 24 seven. I was like, I am physically at the best point of my life. I have the time and ability to skate. This job isn't making me happy. I'm going to go all in on skating again. So towards the end of this job, I realized that I didn't want to be there. I realized that this wasn't what I want to do. And it was very, very hard for me because like I said, I thought this was it. My life was not set up. I did not have a backup plan. I did not have anything outside of this. So I was like, I don't have anything in Reading, Pennsylvania. I'm here for this job. I don't love this city. I don't want to stay. I have no friends or family here. If I lose this job or I quit this job, I have nothing. So I kind of started to plan a little bit. Luckily, my friends that I went to college with, they're all, and by all my friends that have been my main friends in skating for decades, they all still lived in Columbus. They all still skated. They were all still friends. They were the only people that were checking in with me daily. They're like, hey, how's it going? Are you okay? Hey, I know you're not happy at your job, but I see you skating a lot. That's awesome. We miss you. Come hang out. So I was like, these people have stayed my friends through thick and thin, through everything that I was doing when I was skating hard, when I was not skating, when I didn't care, when I cared. I was like, maybe I should go to Columbus. So towards the end, this is such a crazy thing. Towards the end of me working there, it was the day before Black Friday and I was packing orders. I was doing things that weren't what uh, I'm hired to be a graphic designer here. Why am I packing orders kind of thing? And I kind of had not being angry because I'm in me as a person. I'm very, what do you need me to do? If I'm at a job, what do you need me to do? You need me to do that? Cool. I got you. What do what can I do to help? It's something that nobody else wants to do. I don't care. I'll do it. What do you need me to do? And that's kind of where I was at there. And it wasn't bad that I was packing orders. The shipment team there was awesome guys. Still work with some of them today. But I was like, something clicked. And I was like, why am I doing this? I was like, they've had me managing a gym. I've been managing social media accounts. The whole reason I got hired here was to be a graphic designer for a clothing company. That is my wheelhouse. That's what I'm good at. That's been my job for the longest time. That's what my portfolio is. And I was kind of almost talking out loud to myself about this. And one of the higher ups there heard me. So he's like, hey, let's, let's go take a walk around the outside. And he was like, so what's going on? He's like, he's like, you're not normally this type of person. He's like, you know, you're not negative, but you're like, you're just not being yourself. And I kind of laid it out. And I was like, I got hired here to be a graphic designer. I'm managing a gym. Like, that's not what I do. And I was like, I'm a little confused about why I'm here. Like, I want to be doing design work. I feel like I could bring so much to this company and that's why I got hired. I was like, well, I don't understand what I've been doing the, like, all this time. I'm thinking this is a positive conversation. I'm thinking that, you know, all this is going to be, okay, great. He's going to go back and talk to the owner. <clears throat> They're going to, you know, go ahead and like figure it out. Like, oh, well, we've been slacking on Stefan doing design work. Let's let him do what he's good at. Come in the next day, bagel in my mouth, coffee in hand, got a backpack with camera gear. I'm, I'm all over the place. Before I even get in the door, they're like, hey, come in the office. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna set my stuff down. They're like, no, come in the office. I'm like, oh no, what happened? So they're like, can you sit down? I'm like, yeah. They're like, we're gonna let you go. So my mind starts racing. It's the day before Black Friday. I am only in this place because I'm at this job. I have a apartment that I'm paying for only because of this job. I'm not gonna find a good enough job in that area to pay for this apartment that I'm in. 
like I, I went all out because this was such a, a, a cushy job and I was so excited. So many things started racing in my mind of like, what do I need to do? Like, what am I going to do? So they were like, here's your severance. You know, we realize that you can't, like we're, we're pulling you down. So I was very thankful about that. It was not a negative experience. It was, you're a graphic designer, you're creative, you're skating. Like, that's what you should be doing. Here you go. Like, good luck kind of thing. Like, no hard feelings, goodbye. I had a very negative time the couple months before that, obviously, and I was in a very bad spot. And like we were saying earlier, when you're down in the dumps and you're at your lowest point, at least for me, that's when I push the hardest into what I want to do. And I remember at that moment, I was like, I'm moving to Columbus, I'm doing freelance, I'm skating hard. Like this is like I like this is it. Like I'm tired of somebody else dictating what I do and and dictating my life. And this is such a silly thing, but I remember maybe a week or two, uh, no, maybe a little bit more, maybe a month or two before I left and that happened. I shaved my head. I'd always had hair. I'd always hated having hair. I would have to go get my hair cut every two weeks and I hated it. I said, screw this, I'm shaving my head. I went to a contest in New York City the next day, being around a ton of people that I knew in skating for decades that were my best friends, kind of show up wearing all black, head shaved, everybody knowing that I'm not in the best situation in my life at my job, and I ended up winning the contest. I'm not a contest skater. I'm not, I, I don't really like that atmosphere as in, inside of like the role winning community. I'm more of a, I love video parts. I like going and pushing myself on the street. I like, um, like I said, that physicality and creativity at the same time. It, it gives me, being a creative too, it gives you something to kind of strive for and work on and be creative. So contests are not really my thing. It's, that's more of like a jockey, athletic, you know, th that sort of uh, wheelhouse. And I remember I won the contest because I skated like myself. I did what I wanted to do and I won because it was different than what everybody else was doing. I rolled in on a basketball hoop and that was like the big thing. And I remember coming back from that and being like, I am happy with who I am truly top to bottom for the first time in my life. Cause I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't want to be at this job. I knew I wanted to go into skating. I was happy with how I looked. I was happy with the choices I was making. I was doing my own thing again. I wasn't wearing what everybody at the gym was wearing. I wasn't wearing their clothes. I wasn't following what they did. I finally said, I don't care. Screw all of it. I'm doing me again. So, and from that point, and I was going in so deep into that story as, as comes to this, from that point until now, I am the happiest I have ever been in my life. And do you think a lot of that comes from, like a lot of finding that happiness comes from simply experiencing a bunch of things that didn't make you happy. 1,000%. I said that to my parents so many times while I was at that job that when it started to go bad, because I would talk to them all the time, I'd be like, I'm so unhappy. Like, this sucks. I can't do anything. Like, I can't be, as a creative, as a creative person, if you have no creative outlet or you are forced to not do the things that make you creative, you go crazy. Anybody that is a creative can attest to that. Anybody that is artistic can attest to that. If you're to tell a painter, you can't paint, you're not allowed to paint anymore. But we're going to give you a job as a quote unquote painter doing this, but you can't paint. That person would go nuts. They would be depressed. They would be upset. They would go crazy. You can and manage the paint store, but you can't paint on your own. 1000%. And that's what was happening to me. And it took me a while to realize that. And I was so down and I was so upset. And like a lot of the things I've said, I've realized because I was the person that would go home from work and just sit and binge Netflix because I wasn't happy. I had nothing else. You know, you can't skate in the winter. During the winter, I would just, I would work, get out of work, go to the gym, go home, go to sleep, work. And it was just that every single day on weekends. I wouldn't do anything on weekends. I would just sit. And so I, I am understanding of people that are in those situations now. I get why they're like that. But at the same time, you also have to have that self-realization to pull yourself out. When it's the ability to learn from like failures or mistakes yep. or just negative situations. Because I think we're, we're always so focused on like, and it, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with wanting things to go well. But I, I think it is easy to get so caught up on like, I just, I just want this to work. You don't, yep. you don't see the opportunity of like, well, if this doesn't work and it ends up being a crappy situation that I didn't want it to be, what can I learn out of that? 
and it, it's going to help me shape into what I actually want after I find out a bunch of things that I don't want first. One of the biggest things that I kept saying while I was so unhappy there was I am learning what to do by seeing what I don't want to do. Yeah. I wasn't learning by seeing the things I wanted to do. It was the opposite. It was, okay, this is how not to treat your employees. This is how not to run a business. This is how not to treat people. Instead of, hey, this is the way you treat people. You should design like this. Like this is a, I learned the opposite way. And it's unfortunate that that happened. And like I said, that was another one of those times in my life where I was so miserable and so unhappy. But coming out of that, what I thought was supposed to be my dream job, to going to like, I have nothing, what am I gonna do? To now since then, like I said, that was such a turning point in my life. From then on, I have been doing everything I wanna do. I've been happy as I've ever been. And it, I'm very glad that I went through it. I would not change anything. Yeah. So carry me through a little bit. So we, we get to Columbus, obviously. We, yep. cool. we move there. We're going to go like into full freelance and all that sort of yep. stuff. Walk me through like the balance of figuring out how freelance worked for you now, now that you're like finally, quote unquote, allowed to do it again. Yep. And also carry me through the clothing line stuff because Lumen stops at some point, Lumen right? St- Lumen stopped a couple years before um, I went to that fitness job. Okay. So coming out of that fitness job, I wanted to do clothing. But at the time, I just didn't have that much going on. So this is about, I want to say 2017, I moved to Columbus. So around that time, I was just focused on skating. I wanted to skate and I wanted to do freelance. I didn't care about anything else. Aside from that point in Raleigh where I was like skating every single day, no other time in my life have I skated that much as when I moved back to Columbus. I had my filmer, my, the, the first person that ever filmed me who's also my best friend. He's here. All he does is film. I have sponsors that are giving me chances to be promoted to do things. So it's like I have an excuse to push myself. I have a group of friends that all skate that are – amazing humans that I love to be around. So I'm around, a, p- part of the thing that I have realized too about a lot of people that, that rollerblade specifically, if you don't have a tight community and a lot of good people around you, there's not a whole lot of reason to skate by yourself. It's not that fun, especially when you show up at the skate park and you're, they're in a small town, me growing up in a small town. If you go to a skate park, you're the only rollerblader there. You can't go as a rollerblader and be like, oh, I'll go to the skate park. There'll be all the rollerbladers there like skateboarding. I'm a skateboarder in a small town that has no friends at skateboard. I can go to the skate park and see other skateboarders. That is not the same for rollerblading. So to have a community of rollerbladers that are my best friends, that are motivated, that make skating fun, like that that year after what I had dealt with, coming back here and being around that, I filmed the most I've ever filmed. I put out a bunch of sections. And luckily enough, at the end of that year, the like main sponsor that I had turned me pro. And I don't know if this is something to get into. This is more of a a skating thing, but a lot of bad things happened as far as like industry things and the way that company was run. So I worked for however many years, you know, since my dream since I was 13 was to do nothing but skate. I get that shot and I realize that they don't care. They don't care. This company does not care about rollerblading or the community as a whole. And they definitely don't give a shit about me. So instead of like every single other person in rollerblading, and this is no offense to anybody that I know, that stayed with this company because, well, there's no other sponsors. There's nobody else. Well, I'm not getting paid here. I'm not going to get paid anywhere else. I said, fuck you guys. How dare you treat me like this? I'm out. I don't care that you just gave me this title that I've been waiting for forever. I have coming from, and you'll understand this, coming from the punk and the hardcore scene, I have ethics. I stand up for what I believe in. I know who I am as a person. You don't get to treat me like that because you treat everybody else on the team like that. So I was like, I don't care if it's my dream. I don't care about anything else. I was like, if you're going to not care about me and use me, I'm out. And people thought I was crazy. It's like, you just worked so hard and did so much and did your best work to get to this point to literally get it and then immediately say, screw you guys. Yeah. But for me, like I said, me being who I am and having those ethics, I can't stand by and watch a company that doesn't care about me or our community treat people that way and not stand up and say something about it. Mm-hmm. So that leads into me 
getting on another brand. It's a, a, another main, the main skate brand. And after a year of skating the hardest I've ever skated, having the same situation happen of kind of, well, we don't really care about you. We're going to tell you we're going to do all these things for you. But in actuality, we don't give a shit about you. Sounds very similar to a lot of independent record labels. but <laughs> Oh, absolutely. You have no clue. So, And it was the same situation of, I'm not, I just worked, I, I made, at that time, that was the best video part that I had ever made. I stressed and wrecked myself for almost a year. It was about eight months that I worked on that, knowing what it was supposed to be for, to hand it to them a week before it's supposed to come out and then being like, eh, by the way, we're not doing that anymore. And me being like, okay, well, I just worked so hard for eight months on the thing that in my life, I, up to that point, was the most proud of, in, in skating, that I was the most proud of. Like, this is my magnum opus kind of thing. Like, this is the music that I've, I'm using the music finally that I love. I'm doing the exact type of skating at my best. Like, and I'm giving it to you for it to be for something special for you to say, eh, maybe next year. So I kind of took that in and I was like, okay, well, I've just had this amazing year. You guys are trying to do these things. Like I, I speak so highly of you. You've been so supportive. And I kind of was like, okay, I wonder what's going on. Right after that, another friend of mine that was about at the same level, they had told both of us that we would never be professionals because we were too old. He's 28, I'm 32. That is the average age of most skaters and most professionals in our community. And he especially was so on the rise, so on the come up, that it was like a guarantee that he was going to go pro kind of thing. And for them to say that to him and then to me after what had just happened, I took a step back and I'm like, okay, maybe this is not uh, maybe this is another situation of what I just dealt with with this other sponsor. So every year in February, we have a massive contest in the Netherlands. It's about an hour outside of Amsterdam. Everybody goes. I had gone for the first time the year before to be with the sponsor. So it was the first time I get to meet everybody in person. Like it's, the, the team is worldwide. There's people from Japan. There's people from Latvia. There's people from everywhere. So we all come together and we're there together, and it was great. It was the first time, whatever. So, hey, we're going to do it again this next year. So at that time, I was working a part-time job on top of my freelance. The part-time job had become my main source of income. I lost that job. I came to them, and I said, hey, I'm not going to be able to make this international trip that you're not helping or paying for. I can't make it. I need to save the money that I had for this trip to support my life. I have a girlfriend. I have a, a apartment with her. Like we have rent and bills and a dog. Like I have a life now. Like I'm not just willy nilly college kid living out of my car that on a whim can just be like, oh, I'll just go. I was like, it's not like that. I like, I'm, I'm an adult now. I have, I have a life. And I was like, it's a little bit more important for me to save my money to support myself than it is to go on this random trip. The comment that I got back was, well, you should care about the team and the brand more than yourself in your life. And at that point, I was like, I'm done. So that's I'm also coming from the team and the brand that said that they didn't really care about you. Yeah, so I'm like, I'm done. I was like, I'm out. So I was like, once again, worked so hard to get to this point that I, I wanted to be at, that it was like my dream and I had this opportunity to have it be, you know, once again, like, I'm not gonna let you say that to me. Mm -hmm. As a brand, you cannot run your business that way. And this is on top of things that were being said to other people, other riders. So once again, I left. And in skating, it was kind of like, well, Stefan's leaving another brand again. What's going on with that? But I didn't care because in my eyes, I was like, you cannot treat somebody that way and expect them to keep putting in all this work for you for nothing. I was like, that's not how you're supposed to run a business. So luckily during this time, I had a frame sponsor and a wheel sponsor that was so professional because he has a job outside of skating and this is his passion project. Yeah, yeah. So it's a classic brand. It's like one of our like grandfathered brands that has been around forever, forever. One of the only ones left from like the early days. And I was lucky enough to be riding for them and I was, you know, pro for them. I had a pro wheel with them and 
he was so insanely supportive and he was kind of like the little guy, even though it's this like classic well-known brand, he, him bringing it back and coming back to skating, he was almost like the little guy and he was giving opportunities to people like myself and other pros that were kind of getting shafted by other brands. And he's kind of sitting here saying, this is not the way that we're supposed to do this. We're going to run things professionally. We're going to do things the right way. And me going through all of the BS that I've gone through, he was kind of like, like, I got you, like, we're good. And that's where I'm at now in skating, where I have him as like kind of my main sponsor with everything going on. And it's been absolutely incredible. And I'm so looking back at, you know, the, like we said, hindsight's twenty twenty. Looking back, I'm so glad I quit those brands. I'm so glad I said, fuck you guys. You can't do that to a person because now I'm in the ideal situation of somebody who says, oh, you want to use that song in that edit? If you like it, go for it. Oh, you want to do some crazy barbed wire and owl graphic for your wheel? That's you, dude. Go for it. So I've kind of gone, like I said, full circle of, you know, being into the same things that inspired me and lit a fire in me in high school. You know, hearing these bands for the first time and being like, this is what I love and seeing skating for the first time and being like, oh my God, this is so cool. I have that passion for everything again, but now I have somebody that's backing me that is saying, well, that's what you're passionate about. Whatever you want, dude, let's go. Yeah. You can, you, you found the full circle moment yep. where at the start it was, I'm going to figure out who I am and I'm going to be myself and see what that attracts. And now everything that's attracting to you is telling you, just be yourself. We're here for that. To go through all of the BS and stick true to who I am and stick to my guns and, you know, be who I am and be unapologetically me. Those times were hard. Like I said, like getting two opportunities of my dream, my favorite thing in the world, rollerblading to, to just travel and film and skate and do nothing else to have two opportunities fall by the wayside. And, you know, to have everything come back around to where it is now, because I said, no, I'm going to, do what I think is right. I'm going to be me. It's so much more fulfilling now looking back and seeing that instead of, it's almost like one of those things of like, instead of taking that deal with the devil, you kind of like waited for the right, the right thing and the right choice. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, I don't know. I'm, I'm in a really good spot now. I'm very happy. Like I've had a lot of amazing opportunities and everything that I've gone through in my life, if I hadn't gone through those things, they wouldn't have led me to the point I'm at now. Dude. Love it. I don't know how we can get a better a better way to wrap up the podcast than that, <laughs> to be totally honest. So first off, is there anything you feel like we missed? Is there, some, is there like a big point where you're like, dude, we didn't even cover this thing and this, I need to share this? I feel like we got to a lot of things. Yeah. Like there's a lot of things that I could get deeper into with skating, but like that's more for the skating community. Right. You know, this is something for people that that are creative to say like, hey, this guy went through all of these things, it may not be the exact similar thing. You know, I went through it with skating, graphic design, whatever. But I think we've gotten to the point of like, hey, like that guy's had some similar things happen to him. If he can do it, I can do it too. Yes, I mean, and and sitting across the table from you for this entire story, there are so many things that I related to in that entire scenario. Every bit of that timeline, there was something that I was like, I did that too. I experienced that too. Again, it's not skating. It's not that particular thing or this particular thing. But it you was, felt the same. You yes. had to deal with that emotionally. Yes. I was like, wow. Okay. Like, so I loved it. I, I do. That was such a fun conversation. And I'm so happy that you were freaking down to do it. And I'm so happy that you were down to share all of that stuff. Because again, that's the point of the podcast. Yeah. Thanks is, for letting is, me is share. to share yeah. those things and show, even if it's me, even if it's me hosting this podcast, talking to you, you're making me feel like, wow, I'm not in the boat alone. Like, wow, I can relate to those things. And it's weird to hear that because when you're in that situation, you feel like you're the only one. Yep. You're like, no one else has ever experienced this yep. thing. This would I not happen to I else. don't know what to do for me. How do I get out of the situation? Yeah. But a lot of the time, somebody else has to deal with it too. So the way I wrap up the podcast every time is I ask one last big question. The deals 
with that sort of thing that deals with the advice, the opinion, all that sort of stuff to share it and wrap it all up into one big bubble of hay. Here's what I want you to hear. So right now, I want you to pretend like everyone everywhere is listening to us talk. So you have a microphone that connects you to literally everyone. Doesn't matter if they're creative, doesn't matter if they live in another country, doesn't matter if they're an entrepreneur, doesn't matter if they collect Ninja Turtle things and that's their hobby. You're talking to everyone. What is it that you want everyone to know? I want everyone to be themselves, as I said, unapologetically. If there is something you love, love it with all of your heart. If there is something you want to do, do it with no fear. Life is too short to not do the things you love to do because you're afraid of somebody else's opinion, because you don't think it's going to work, because you, whatever reason that's holding you back. There's absolutely no reason that you can't do what you want to do. And if you want to do it bad enough, you will make it happen. God, dude, love it. Perfect. That was freaking <laughs> wonderful, man. Thank you so much. I'm gotcha, so dude. I'm so stoked I got you on this I'm podcast. I'm glad we got to do this. I'm finally. so happy. So before we officially close everything up, if you want anyone to find you or anything that you're involved in around the internet, where can they find those things? So any skating videos are going to be all on YouTube. That, like I said, that's my main thing is like my favorite thing in the world to do is to roll a blade and film it and make a video to it to one of my favorite songs. It's my favorite thing in the world. I love it. Uh, on YouTube, you can find those under balanced distribution, or if you just search for my name, it's there. Um, otherwise on Instagram, I'm just at Stefan Brando. Shoot me a message. If you want to start skating, I'll get you some skates. We'll start skating together. If you just want to chat, hit me up. I'm always open beautiful do you want to plug outward too do you want anyone to check out Outward? oh yeah we didn't really get into that but yeah. i do i do still have a clothing brand it's at outward co um you know with everything that's happened this year it's kind of been slow and i've been able to focus more on skating which is my main love in life so but yeah outward co perfect there it is man we plugged and promoted everything and we got your story so dude thank you so much thank you ross that was fun What a fun episode. Such a cool story. Stefan shared so much there, and I, I loved hearing all of it. I hope you did too. So make sure to go check out everything that he does, all the stuff we talked about. His skate videos are insane. His graphic design work is amazing. His clothing brand rules. Anything he touches is going to be awesome. So check those things out and just support a good dude. If you'd like to support some other stuff as well, mainly this show, I'd heavily appreciate it if you made sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. That way, any new episodes just pop straight into your feed when they've released every other Monday, at least currently that's the schedule. If you like the show or if you're an avid listener, please make sure to leave a rating and a review on iTunes that genuinely helps iTunes itself rate the show and say, hey, Maybe we should uh, make sure we show this to more people and make sure more people know about this because these people seem to like it. And of course, after all that, please keep up with the show on social media by following us at WYDHPod or following me and my work personally at Who's Ross Tyson. Tyson is spelled T-H-E-I-S-E-N, and there it is. There's the plugs and promotions, but most importantly, that was another fun conversation that I really, truly love to have, and I'm glad I got to share it with all of you. So, as always, thank you so very much for listening, especially if you listen to, to all, all the way to the end of the episode. I seriously appreciate that. As if you couldn't listen to me talk enough through the intro and a two-hour episode like this one, you keep listening all the way to the end. So, hey, I appreciate that. So, of course, you're going to hear me talk even more in the next episode because I'll be back with a guest once again that you may or may not know with a story that you've probably never heard before. Thanks.